Okay, well, on my mind. Online learning needs to be more about, uh, more than simply about web-based courses and users. Uh, there's a variety of functions within Moodle that can help us better manage users and personalise their learning and also track their progress. So that's essentially the purpose of this morning's webinar. Just a quick roadmap in terms of where we're headed. Um, I won't go into great detail uh, with, with the slides here. I'd rather demonstrate some of these things and perhaps take a few questions uh, as we go along. But um, essentially, there's some materials we've shared with you, uh, some links and resources within this presentation as well, which you can follow up um, you know, at your leisure. But essentially, we're going to cover this morning roles, groups, groupings and cohorts, activity completion and progress tracking. Okay. Now, uh, it's, it's noteworthy that uh, perhaps roles and groups, maybe groupings as well, are uh, 1.9, Moodle 1.9 functions. Uh, if you are, in fact, using or interested in Moodle version 2, uh, you've also got the benefit of cohorts, activity completion, and progress tracking. Okay, so essentially today's uh, demonstration relates to the latest, greatest uh, stable version of Moodle learning management system software. So just bear that in mind. Um, and and I, I guess some of the things we're demonstrating today are on the premise that the administrator has configured them or enabled um, the functions and also that uh, you've at least got uh, you know, editing teacher or perhaps course manager uh, capabilities. We'll perhaps kick start with a poll just to gauge uh, very quickly, the uh, I guess the, the background and experience of, of you, the audience, uh, before we, we get into the, the demonstration itself. And Shalon has just launched a poll. You'll see that popping up on your screen momentarily. Um, if you could indicate uh, which of the following functions you are familiar with, if you can select more than one. Um, this is anonymous, by the way. We'll see what comes through. Perhaps leave that up for 30 seconds. Okay, five seconds and we'll close the poll. Thank you. And we'll just display the results just to give a quick indication of where we're at. Okay, so it's, again, roles we're fairly familiar with and perhaps groups. We're unsure about cohorts and progress tracking, activity completion of you know, there's at least a, a percentage of us that indicated um, some familiarity. Very good. Okay, okay so, so perhaps we'll kick start with, uh, with roles and that case. We'll leave, we'll leave the details of this presentation for, for your perusal at a later stage. It's going to be a live demo on itself. So, this is just plain standard, 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 standard vanilla, vanilla Moodle, Moodle version, version 2 installation. So as far as roles are concerned, roles are essentially, are essentially if you like, if you like use the metaphor, the metaphor of a hat, the hat, the hat that wears, wears in a given, in a given context uh, throughout the learning management system. So uh, you know, the hat that they wear, it might be the, the admin or the teacher or the student hat, uh, the student hat for example. Okay? And there's different contexts, global, uh, category, course, activity block, even user context where a role can be assigned. Now, if we go to on the front page of the Moodle site administration, users. Missions to find roles. We can see these roles see. here. Um, um, these these standard, standard default roles, default roles such, such as manager, manager course, course creator, creator teacher, teacher, either editing or not editing, student, guest. So, 
So they each have a description and a short name, and you, you can view these roles. Okay, so by way of example, we could go into teacher role. And we can see that a teacher can pretty much do anything in a course, including changing activities and grading students. Now, on the left side of the screen, we've got capabilities. If you'd like, like, these, these, are, these, these are, are the things, things that a said role can potentially see or do in a given context. Now, down the left-hand side of this page is, is a couple of hundred capabilities. A bit further over to the right, we've got permissions. Permissions more or less indicate whether the capability is being set to allow or prevent. Okay. Or well, more in particular, we can have uh, prohibit or inherit. So there's quite a few settings there as far as the permission goes on each of its respective capabilities. Um, it's probably best practice to leave the default roles as they are. If you want to create a custom role, the way to go would be to duplicate a role. Okay, call it something else, and you set an archetype, which I guess is you know it's kind of it's kind of the the base settings for this new custom role, and then you can, to your heart's content, um, set the permissions for the respective capabilities as you see fit. All right, I won't follow through with that, but that is in essence. Um, how we would go about at least doing a role and or duplicating a role for custom purposes. Okay, so we've got the roles here. What we do want to do, perhaps if I return to the front page, by way of example, um, in the settings block, we've got users, permissions, we can assign the system roles. Uh, for 2.0, uh, by default, Manager, Manager and Course Creator. Creator. They are the only standard roles uh, that can be applied uh, systemically or globally or site-wide, if you like. Okay, the others are a bit dangerous. In one point, in the other version, uh, for example, you could apply um, globally, teacher or student or, or any role um, out of the box, and, and that could be fairly dangerous when a user would come in and sort of be able to see and do everything in all courses across the entire system, and that was perhaps not the intended the intention of the administrator. All right. So typically, roles aren't assigned globally or systemically; um, they're, they're assigned at a, at a course category or a, a course level, or even at an activity level. Okay. So we'll go into a course. We're going to do standard course. And this is blank canvas. Okay, we come down to the settings block, course administration. Users. users. Enrolled, Enrolled users. users. So at the moment we've got uh, a course creator, a manager and a teacher enrolled in this course. If we want to enrol other users, we would click the button and we can see up at the top here, assign, assign roles. So which role, what hat do we want to allocate to a said user uh, in this course context? So in this case, uh, a student role. So they don't edit the course or create the activities or resources, but they can certainly participate and get involved. So let's click the enroll button alongside the users that we wish to enroll and essentially assign a role uh, in this course. Finish enrolling users. So uh, those users are there. We can see uh, on this enroll user page, now been added, we can see uh, if they had in fact uh, access the learning management system or, or this particular course, what, what role they have been assigned and, and, the, and the enrollment method. In this case, this was manual. So this was either the administrator or the heading teacher who have enrolled all of these users and assigned them a role in this set course. Okay, so that's the process. If we went to the participants page, we'll see a similar story. Okay, and if we toggle from all participants,
to the stew roll. We can see them there as well. Okay, I'm going to move on to groups. Groups are essentially a collection of course participants. So when the users have an account and they've been assigned a role in a said course, you can then manage them. Uh, you can manage them as a collection or a bunch, I suppose, or a group. Um, and, and there might be various reasons for organising users into groups in a said course. So it could be by their year or their location or uh, you know, a business unit, for example. Uh, we can manually create the groups. I think what might be easier in this case and a bit quicker is to simply auto-create the groups. So we're going to select members from a given role. That can be the student. And we're going to specify. It could either be the number of groups or the, uh, I suppose, the number of members per group. Okay, you can choose which way you want to go. Um, We'll have perhaps four groups and we're going to allocate the members randomly. We'll just preview that. That looks okay. In fact, what might be more logical uh, is if we allocate them by alphabetically, first name, last name. See how this looks. I'm happy with that. So if I click Submit, that should auto-create the groups based on you know, the students in the said course. So we can see on, the, on this particular page now, sort of a summary of the groups. We've got four groups, A, B, C and D, and in brackets the number indicates that the members of the group. All right, so if we click Group A and we look across to the right-hand side, we can see student one and two are enrolled. Group B, three and four so on and so forth. Okay, so our users are enrolled. Uh, naturally, at any point in time, you could add or remove users from any particular group. Okay, what we've done at this stage is simply, I guess, auto-populate the groups. Okay, now where it gets interesting is uh, I guess there's three modes as far as a group setting is concerned. You can force group mode um, at, a, at a course level if you want uh, for all activities and resources. Um, or you can simply do it on a on a case by case basis with given activities. Now questions just come through. Can we rename the groups? Uh, most certainly. You know, it'd be a case of simply selecting the group, you click um, edit group settings and you could give it a name, you could rename that group, you could put a description. Uh, you could in fact um, you could associate an image, a picture with a particular group. And that would that would present itself alongside like an like below the user's avatar when they post to discussion forums for example. Okay? You could in fact set an enrollment key like a single use password on a group. And then unless the user enters that enrollment key upon self-enrolment or self-registration, they don't, they don't become a member of the group, automatically speaking. Okay, so there's quite a few possibilities, perhaps beyond the scope of what we're planning to do this morning, um, but it's very customizable. So we've got our groups. As far as these course settings are concerned, uh, in the settings block, course admin, edit settings, uh, as far as groups are concerned, what we see down here, Partway down the course settings page is groups, and the group mode, as I said, you could set this by default to either no groups, which is fairly standard, uh, or separate, which is essentially isolated groups, think of it like that, or visible groups. So instead of having one big virtual classroom of all your course participants, you can, you can in some ways separate them, either uh, in an isolated sense or visibly. You can force that group mode, as I said, if, if you wanted to, on all activities and resources across the course. Um, unless you've got really strong motive to do that, I'd probably advise against it. So you would, you would change the settings and click the uh, Save Changes button at the bottom. So we're editing on, just to, just to I suppose, uh, illustrate how this could in fact work, if we were to add we've on, add an activity, it can be a forum, 
or a discussion from, this is a public space where people ask questions, get answers, help one another. So we'll call it group, group forum. It's going to be a standard forum for general use and we're just going to exchange ideas. Okay, now further down, the common module settings, this is where we set it to uh, group mode. So perhaps let's, in this instance we'll go with separate groups. So these are isolated or if you like invisible groups. Save and display. Okay, now unlike a normal non-group forum, up the top we've got a drop menu, okay, um, where we could toggle if you like to any one of those groups and post uh, or communicate with that group in particular. So we're not broadcasting to all participants in all groups. Uh, we, want to, we want to get some conversation started with a, with a group in particular. So let's say group A, toggle like so, and we add a new discussion topic. So we'll, so we'll simply say, say this uh, is a, so we'll say this is for topic, um, topic or group group A group A only. Like, like so. so. And, and you can fax it in the bottom if you had any doubt who you're in fact communicating with. Um, so it says there this is for group A. So, so we post to the forum. I did, I did mention, but it's fair to say that editing teachers. Um, you know, they can belong to a group, that works fine, they don't have to. Uh, and on the same token, uh, users can belong to multiple groups, or no groups at all, and, and still happily use the course, but perhaps not uh, enjoy the benefits of a group. So we can now see there's a conversation for group A. Um, if we toggle to group B, for example, there's no conversations there yet. Okay, so that's in essence the way this would work. Um, if we were to perhaps, uh, perhaps take this one step further with grouping and then I can illustrate uh, from a student point of view what they will be able to see or not see and do, um, that would perhaps work best. As far as grouping is concerned, um, groupings if you like is a cluster or a combination of groups. Okay? Uh, it can be used as a way to further granularise not just activities but also resources in a given course. Okay, so where we might use the groups function to, to I guess, micromanage discussion forums and quizzes and assignments, glossaries and databases and so forth. If you've got files, uh, a sensical way to go about it is to use the grouping function if you want to control exactly who can see what at any point in time. Okay. Now, what we would in fact need to do, just to be certain here, um, under the settings block, course administration, users, is groups. So we go back to where we were before, and this is all fine, but up the top, you may or may not have noticed, there's a tab now for groupings. Okay, and this is, I suppose, on the presumption that the administrator has enabled groupings, and naturally, um, groups need to exist before you can make use of the groupings function. Okay, they go hand in hand. We can't have groupings without first having groups in place. So we click the groupings tab. Remembering if you like, this is like a combination or cluster of groups. So we click the button reads, create grouping. So let's call this grouping one. Same thing with groupings. You could organize these logically by geography or by year um, or business unit. You know, there's a multiplicity of ways this could be utilised. Um, we click the little figurine icons over to the right near edit to, uh, to add groups to a grouping. So let's say for grouping one, we're going to add, make a multiple selection, we'll add group A and B. So the members essentially of group A and B are also members of grouping one. Back to groupings. Let's just create our second grouping. Grouping two. And 
MLAD groups, C and D, to grouping two. Okay, so that's set in place. That is all fine. If we return to the course page, and we're editing, still on. Let's add a resource on this occasion. Let's make a file. I'll simply say this is a grouping file. Again, you would you would call it what it is. The end user doesn't need to know this has anything to do with the grouping function. Put a mandatory description. And we come down to content and we select a file. So we click the add button and you can browse uh, whether it's one of your repositories or some other location for a file. So uh, select a file. Now down here in common module settings, part way down page, we've got an option here where we can check the box and it enables grouping. So we select grouping one or grouping two. So let's say in this case for grouping one, we want simply members of, if you like, groups A and B, but not C and D to be able to see this particular file or document or resource. This is how we can go about it. Okay. Save and return to course. So as far as we're concerned, either as an administrator or an editing teacher, we can see in brackets after this particular learning object that it is for the eyes of members of grouping one only. You know that's groups A and B. So I think it's time to log out just to get an idea how this might work. So logging in out as administrator. I'll come back in momentarily as a student. This is student one. Now student one was assigned a student role a little while ago. They also belong to group A and group one. So we can see here they come in to the, the forum and then they should see the conversation that was initiated there by the administrator. So they're good to go and they can read, respond or start their own conversations in that particular discussion forum. Okay, and that's completely isolated and set for the other groups sharing the same course. On the same token, they can see the file that was meant for grouping one. Okay, so that is all good. They could open that file, print it, save it. I'll log out in contrast. Uh, let's choose another dummy student that's been involved there before. Let's say student eight. Also enrolled in the course and assigned a student role. However, they belong to group D and grouping two. So if we go into the discussion forum, there's no conversations there for Group D at this point in time. Okay. Back on the course page, on the same token, they cannot see that document file that was shared or made available for Grouping 1. So hopefully, in some respect, that illustrates how the groups and the grouping function may be utilised. So I'll log out again as the student and come back in. as the admin. As far as cohorts is concerned, this is also, uh, also referred to as site-wide groups or category level groups. Okay, so it takes the whole groups um, functionality, if you like, beyond the course context and it can be utilised at a course category or a site-wide, a system level. All right? And it, it was a very wanted feature for Moodle 2. Uh, it found its way onto the roadmap and is now part of the standard release. So, good news. So, what we can do here essentially, uh, the cohort function, it, it makes it very easy to enrol a complete uh, cohort membership 
in a course in a single action, either manually or automatically. That's in essence what it does. So it, it'll make make our jobs easy as administrators. All right. But on the same token, it needs to be enabled and first configured. So where we would go, uh, this is via the front page, settings block, site administration, users, accounts, cohorts. Okay, so there's a few clicks to get to this. Now, uh, no cohorts available at the moment, but we've got a button here. So we click that to add a cohort. So we think of a cohort as a site-wide or a category level group. So we'll give it a name again. As far as cohorts are concerned, these could be organised logically by by year um, or semester, uh, by location, by business unit. Again, again, much the same flexibility as you've got with groups and groupings in terms of how you how you structure this logic. So we will call this say the AU cohort. Okay. The context can be either system or miscellaneous. Miscellaneous in this case is is the default default course category. All right. If we had more course categories, they would display in that drop menu. We'll stick with system. The other fields are optional. Save changes. So we've now created our first cohort. Um, there's no members of the cohort yet. What we need to do is assign as a starting point. Okay, so we've got potentially um, 12 members of the, that we can add to this cohort. We'll select eight, and that being the students, and we will add them. Okay, so they've just been added to the cohort. If we go back to cohorts, and we get a bit of a summary here. Again, this is where we could edit or delete or, or assign members manually to a set of cohorts, um, or create new cohorts, again, at a system or category level. If we return to the front page, and what we'll do is go to a course. We'll go to the Features Demo Course. Okay, this is, this is one prepared earlier, it's a fully, fully fledged course. Now, what we will do here, again, we would need to be logged in as either the admin or the, uh, the manager. We go to the settings block, course admin, users, and enrollment methods. We need to add a new enrollment method to any course where we want to use the cohort. Or sync functions, if you like. Okay, so, so add the method, and we choose it. And again, this is on the presumption that this this enrollment method has been enabled globally by the administrator first. Okay, um, it would then become available in this drop menu for any course. So we could add it as a method. Um, no surprises for guessing what's under this drop menu here. When we go to choose a cohort, we can select. Um, any cohort that we've created and the role that we want to uh, assign to the users who are in fact members of that particular cohort. All right, so it could be student, it could be teacher, manager or a custom role for example. We'll say student and we click add method. So in essence what we've now done is automatically or if you like we've enrolled eight users uh, into this set course. Okay, uh, we don't have to. As far as the cohort synchronisation of enrolments is concerned with this course, we don't have to handle the enrolments manually. Uh, all we would need to do as an administrator um, would be back in the site admin where we had users, accounts, cohorts is manage the synchronizations here. So if you like, as we as we add users to the cohort on this page, they would automatically, as long as we've got that cohort sync enrollment method set up in the set course, they would be added automatically. And that's sort of the idea behind it. 
and naturally you could have a, a, a cohort sync um, enrollment method added to each of your courses and instead of manually enrolling each of the members of the cohorts in each of those individual courses, you simply come to this page and just be certain as, as your new members come along that they're added to a said cohort. So if you like, you can kind of map out a learning path. I think that's the obvious benefit okay, where you're not simply enrolling users as I've demonstrated here in a single course, but um, perhaps you want to serve up the learning path in a, in a series of courses to a, to a set membership or a cohort. Okay? So in summary, again, think of cohorts as site-wide groups that can be manually or auto automatically synchronised with uh, course enrolments. Okay, I'm mindful of time, perhaps in the, in the remaining 10 minutes or so, I'm keen to demonstrate activity completion and progress tracking. These have less to do with uh, groups and groupings and roles and cohorts, but more to do with, I suppose, monitoring uh, progress through a course. Um, up until Moodle version 2, it was very difficult for admins and teachers, and, and for students for that matter, to, to know where they were at. It's very hard to know if, uh, if, a, if a course participant had in fact commenced a course, or if they were partially completed, or if they'd successfully completed the course. It was, it was a rule. It was an unknown, an unknown thing. Um, it's, it's, it's now very clear as far as activity completion and project progress tracking are concerned. So as far as uh, setting this up, uh, what will be important in naturally the administrator would need to be certain that uh, enrollment um, activity completion and progress tracking are enabled. I might just quickly backtrack just to, just to illustrate where via the front page. Just having a little look here under um, settings block, site administration, advanced features. Uh, we need to enable completion tracking. Okay, and also um, conditional access. Okay, so not on by default, the admin turns those on and it will be Happy days. These can also, um, as far as course defaults are concerned, these can be set. So you don't have to make this decision or your teachers don't need to make this decision on a course by course basis. So you can see down here student progress, you can enable and check the box so the tracking begins at enrollment. So we'll go back to the sandpit. As far as, so when those things are enabled globally by the admin, the editing teacher can come into the settings block, course admin, edit settings. And we can see down here in the course settings page, student progress. Okay, so completion tracking is enabled and it begins on enrollment. So this is very nice in the sense that it allows teachers to set access to an activity or a resource um, conditionally. So it's upon meeting certain standards of completion, if you like, of another activity or resource. So for example, you know, a student, we could say, needs to post to a forum before they can view a document, before they can attempt a quiz. And when they've attempted the quiz to 100%, uh, we need to know, and they want to know, um, that they've successfully completed the course and then perhaps they want to know what comes next. So we'll set up that perhaps as a use case scenario uh, in the time we've got remaining. Um, what's important as well, just a little aside, I should mention there's a couple new blocks that relate to activity completion and progress tracking. You'll want to add these and uh, uh, add them to your course. So there's, they're up on the top right here as I'm, as I'm demonstrating. You've got course completion status block and you may also want to enable the self completion block depending whether or not you're going to allow your students to indicate I guess or sort of uh, self indicate course completion. Definitely the course completion status block needs to be enabled. So 
we've got a forum that's uh, we've created that already. If we go and revisit settings, just by way of example, so we've got down in the activity settings here, we've got some new parameters you might not have seen before or noticed. Restrict access and activity completion. Okay, so we're going to concern ourselves with these. So as far as the, the discussion forum is concerned, let's say that what we've got here um, for completion tracking that will show this activity as complete when conditions are met. Okay, so we want to make this form available from the get-go, but to mark it as complete, we're going to say that student is required to view the activity, and we'll say as well that they need to post either a discussion or a reply, just the one. Right, so save return to course. There's other criteria we could use. Okay, so it's not all about actions. It could also relate to, um, you know, dates, um, you know, or even a grade. If, if, if it's an activity as such that requires a grade. So we've set up the forum. Uh, what we might now do is have a dependency between the forum and the file. We want to say, at least for members of Grouping One, that they can't view the file until they've they've viewed the forum and they've posted a response or a discussion topic. So the logic therein lies, we come into this file and, and we want to say, as far as restricting access is concerned to this file, um, we want to say activity completion condition is this forum. It needs to be marked as complete. Right? Um, as far as completing, I guess, this activity, it's not so much an activity but it's a file, is concerned, We'll simply say that indicate when a um, condition is met, and we'll simply say that the student needs to view the activity, and that it will be marked as completed. Save return to course. Okay, so we now see this sort of faint subtext, if you like, that would indicate to us as teachers or admin and to the students that there's some sort of conditional access, if you like. Um, we've also got these tick boxes on the side as well, and these are indicating, if you like, uh, you know, that there's, you know, there's activity completion conditions play here. And again, you don't have to have all activities resources set up in this way. This is a very structured or stepwise approach. approach. Uh, it's not for everybody, but it, but it is a very useful way to control and manage online learning in a course. Um, and, it, and, it's, and it may be for you if, if your learning uh, needs to be delivered in a very linear fashion, let's say. So we've got a form, we've got a file. Um, let's add a quiz as well, just to cap off uh, the learning sequence. Quiz activity, so we're editing on, add an activity, it's a quiz. So I give it a name. Now we come down uh, tool at the bottom, we'll just skip and just trust all the default settings, but as, as far as restricting access is concerned, the activity completion condition here is that they need to view the file, and that file needs to be marked as complete. Uh, as far as completing this quiz activity is concerned, um, you know, we could allow students to mark it manually as completed, but what we'll say, this is going to be an automated process, we're not going to trust our learners in this instance, we're going to show the activity as complete when the conditions are met. Um, and, then, and in this case, we'll say that they need to uh, not just view the activity, we'll say they need to uh, receive a certain grade for it to be deemed complete. All right. Save and return to course. As a matter of fact, um, there's one other thing I need to do. We've set up the quiz, we've got to add questions to it. That's a fairly um, sensical thing. Now I've prepared a few quick quiz questions already. Um, I'm going to get them from the question bank and simply add them to this quiz. All right, so they're good to go. So we've got our learning sequence set up. 
uh, there's one other page we do want to visit before we test this out uh, in the settings block under course administration, completion tracking. Okay, once that's been enabled, that function presents itself in this menu. Okay, so what we do want to do here, uh, in fact, I will unlock options. So we can demonstrate this. Um, what activities are going to be part of this completion tracking? Say the forum, the file, and the quiz. Okay, and in fact, the passing grade will have to be it's enabled and it's no less than 100%. All right, a few other settings here. I won't, uh, I won't labor the point, but let's see how this works. Okay, so I've saved changes. So we've got this set up. Okay. Now, what we'll do is log it out as the administrator. We'll come back in as a student and test this out. Okay, so we see on the right side this course completion status. A uh, quick question, this is a little side has come through. Um, a quiz questions uh, or questions from the quiz bank only available to a particular course or available globally to any course? I mean, that's a great question. Um, by default, it's uh, the, the questions that you add to a bank are uh, available to that course only. They go into the default category for a given course. Um, if you're an administrator, um, or you've got, a, I guess, a capability higher than um, a role that's higher than um, the editing teacher role. Um, you can set up categories that sit higher than the course. So, in essence, uh, technically, yes, you can put questions in a category or a system-wide category question bank that uh, would be visible and available to all users and all courses. So, it can be done, um, but not by default. That answers your question. Look, we've just logged in as the student. We want to see how this activity completion and progress tracking now plays out. We go into the group forum and we read uh, what has been posted and let's reply to that. Posted forum. If you recall just before there we couldn't see uh, the file or the um, or the quiz, they were kind of disabled or faint, if you like, semi-visible on the course page before. But now that we've completed the discussion forum, okay, and the conditions being met, there's a tick as far as the progress is concerned on the right side, and we can now access uh, the file. It's become visible, so I think we'll just pop that up. Um, same page, like so. So we can open that, save it, print it. Um, if we reload this page, I think it's pretty safe to say that condition has been met and the quiz has made itself available to the student. So let's quickly attempt the quiz. I think I know the answers here. Okay, I'm going to submit all and finish. I'm putting the reputation on the line. Oh, 100%. Okay, so that has been done. Now the only catch here is that I'm working off a local, um, I guess, test instance of Moodle. This isn't live to the web. As such, um, there would be a server job 
that needs to be run before you will see the activities completed. At the moment it's 0 to 3. Typically, in a live server environment, when this is configured properly by your server host, um, this will happen automatically in the background and in 5 to 15 minutes that will be updated, if not sooner. Okay. I'll, I'll quickly do a couple of things to see if I can make that setting update itself and we'll wrap things up for questions. Just bear with me for a moment. Okay, look through the eyes of the administrator or the editing teacher who now visits the course at any point in time, you want to see how your students are progressing. So you go to the course completion and status box for your course report. Okay, now the idea there would be that ticks um, would, you get a snapshot if you like of all of your, uh, your, your enrolled participants, in this case your students, and I guess the great items or the you know the, the learning experiences uh, mapped across the top there. And you get ticks in the boxes when things have been completed. Okay, so that's in essence how it works. So I'll just run this job once more. Um, let's see if we can get this coming through. Okay, I'm going to log back in um, as a student. Moment, and we'll see if this fact displays. Well, I do, in fact, get three out of three. So there you have it. Okay, so the self completion wasn't indicated. Um, but 100% pass and the activity is completed. Just one last thing, this is the odds going on the cake and I am mindful of time, we're going to wrap it up very shortly and pause the recording and take, take any questions if you've got a couple of minutes and want to hang around. Um, but what you can now do, this is very nice, so we're not, about, we're not only controlling learning sequence in a given course, what we've, what we've demonstrated here I guess with activity completion and progress tracking is you could, you could po read and post to a forum before you can access a file. And when you've done that, you can do a quiz. And when the quiz is 100% deemed as having, having completed this course, course, what if we then want to link one course to another? So, for example, you've got to do course A before you can do course B. Or you've got to do the sand pit before you can do the features demo. Okay, that, that logic can be set up as well. So, just in closure, uh, you would go to the other course concern and naturally you need to ensure that you've enabled activity completion and progress tracking. In the completion tracking page, there's an option here where you can set another course as a prerequisite. Okay, so we could select or set sandpit um, as if you like um, the course completion criteria. Um, you know, it's a prerequisite if you like before this course can be. Uh, well, not attempted, but deemed as complete. Okay, cool. So we would come down, save that, and naturally that's, you know, the, the sandpit as a prerequisite for features demo may be just simply one criteria within a variety of things that need to happen within this particular course for this to be deemed as complete. All right, I think you get the idea with that. So I'm going to wrap up and pass back to Shlona. Uh, thanks for your time and I hope, uh, hope the session has been beneficial. Thanks Chad, that was a great session. Thank you Ridless for participating in today's webinar presented by My Learning Space. We trust this session has been of benefit to you. If you'd like to learn more about Moodle 2.0 and its functionalities or any of our expert services, please feel free to contact us. If you have any questions, please ask them now. To everyone, we look forward to seeing you again in our future webinars and happy Moodling.